at the time. Okay, there yes, so uh, okay. just accept it. Yes. All right, we're good? Yes, we are good. So go on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I call this talk uh, work in planning because I felt progress was a little much for me. Um, but it's about um, evolutionary algorithm optimization of CA for vector expansion. Um, so I'm always a little bit um, uncertain whether or not people are familiar with uh, my things. So uh, if anyone wants to raise their hand and want me to explain cellular automata. Okay, there's a couple, okay, very good. Um, so cellular automata is this very simple um, system where you are, in this example, you only have two states, black or white, zero, one. Um, gosh, I'm guessing we're all very familiar with binary. Uh, that is completely deterministic. Uh, it uh, sets its next state based on a limited set of neighbors, uh, and it's completely deterministic what sort of state the next state was, will be in, depending on what its and its neighbor states are. You see a very slow example of that going on, uh, and it's, this rule is called uh, rule 110 because that is uh, the binary of uh, the eight different neighborhoods it can have with the, when it has only three um, neighbors to consider. And if you speed it up, uh, it can look a bit like uh, the other slide here. Uh, if it could go fast enough or over long enough time. Um, and it's a little bit interesting thing because uh, that little 110 there is apparently Turing complete because someone has shown that you can uh, put a Turing machine in it. Now, of course, we can say like this is a completely parallel system. It's just Turing complete is really a good measure of how good this is as a system. But but yeah, it's um, it's about as powerful as you can make a definition for now, at least. It's kind of be interesting to get better ones for parallel systems. But that's not what this talk is about. And I'm combining it with something called reservoir computing. And I've heard some people use the term uh, already. So I think some of you know, but I, I don't think everybody knows this. Uh, so to give you an example, uh, you have your uh, typical uh, machine learning framework. You have some input. You want some specific output. And, yours. and instead of uh, training the like the layers in like uh, in the back propagation for a way where you train like backwards till you sort of find the the error and then you adjust, you just have this um, typically recurrent neural network which is just set up in like some specific activity level. And you just input your uh, information in that, and that sort of um, does some feature separation. And you just have a linear train out the layer to sort of extract the relevant information from that. And uh, like without going too much into detail on how you specifically do that, it's uh, it's it's quite a powerful method in some ways because you can sort of consider the whole thing as an untrained black box. Uh, they are everything in the middle. Uh, of course, it's not fully true that it's completely untrained. You sort of set it up in a way, but you don't train it. You never adjust it. Uh, so you can sort of fill it in with a lot of different things. People have done very weird stuff with like a bucket of water where there's like a wave on the surface that uh, computes for you. Uh, but I'm working with cellular automata. So you project your information in cellular automata and you extract some sort of relevant information based on the states. This is probably very resonant with the hyperdimensional computing uh, frame, um, community, I think. So um, maybe I'm speaking to the uh, preaching to the choir here a little bit, but like why cellular automata? Uh, it's like a very nice theoretical framework around it, so that you can sort of make a lot of um, can build on a lot of information already. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, you can convert these uh, at least the cellular automata that are um, uh, simpler types into just building logic. So the example I gave you earlier could be just uh, reduced to that single function running like a lot of the time on every single cell continuously. And uh, that means you can implement in circuitry, right? It's just a simple Boolean logic gate. So then we get into top topics that you've already talked a bit about, like uh, this can be implemented on FPGAs and you know then you get like energy efficient and uh, perhaps even edge AI um, valid methods. So, uh, the th specific problem I'm trying to um, solve is that there are like a lot of ways, even with a simple system already, when we talk about like vector expansion, there's a lot of ways to set it up. So how do I pick and choose between good uh, methods? So in the bioinspired uh, field, you just uh, try to encode that into like a nice genotype, and then you can use the genetic algorithm to uh, find good uh, combinations. And that's, that's really the gist of what I'm going to try to do. 
uh, but there are some additional things that we've been considering. For example, well, actually, uh, first of all, does everybody know evolutionary algorithm? Is everybody familiar with that? <laughs> Don't have to explain that. Uh, do you want me to? Or no? Okay. Um, so, what? Um, Evergeny actually sent me a very interesting paper that does something very similar, um, where it uh, does what it calls cellular automata, but it's like a, a like a very big combination of well, big as a combination of uh, things that aren't really binary so i would reduce and stay with the binary because that's like the important part of the building logic but i'll take some information from this paper called um, low shot learning and pattern separation using cell automata integrated convolutional neural networks because it does something very interesting uh it's uh, kind of identified a, a problem with uh my my thing here is that like this is going to be very computationally intensive to to sort of test all these things on like some non-trivial benchmark so how do I speed up that process? Well, this thing has done some pre-training where it's uh, training on just some entropy functions and um, and finding some good uh, speciation or diversity of uh, of uh, features from the well the cellular automata it's using. And I could probably do something very similar to that where I um, use these... Um, well, there's this problem with evolutionary well problem or there's this uh, thing about evolutionary algorithm that it sort of has a tendency to like very quickly approach some uh, homogeneous population so a lot of people uh, put in diversity um, methods to ensure that it actually doesn't completely stagnate into the single species um, so there's a lot of the diversity methods that we can apply and you can apply them on some features that you don't actually train on the benchmark itself you can uh, just apply it on like some trivial entropy functions for example and find some diversity through that. And once I have those good candidates of diversity, I can then test on some slightly less uh, trivial uh, benchmark like MNIST or FMNIST, which is uh, what this paper is doing. And well, that's the entire thing, actually. So um, <laughs> like, uh, feel free to ask any questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe, but maybe uh, you um, maybe you can comment. So, in in what way you? I mean, this uh, um, this cellular automata it can be helpful in your opinion to say VSA or AGC, right? Now. So, uh, like the, the strength to me is that it is like, implementable in, in in hardware, right? And it is doing um, like expansion of um, of your um, of your of, of low, low dimensional feature space into into high dimension, you can, you can use it for that because you have like input and you inject it into cell automata and that expands it uh, through the cell automata, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's not new in, in in this study. Some people have done that already. Um, maybe even Dennis has or like um, so. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, very important slide, apparently. <laughs> So yes, yeah, so I think there's like some some um, co in, uh, co interests with the high dimensional um, uh, computing and uh, reservoir computing where we are like trying to solve the same thing, where I want to find a good way to represent my information in the reservoir, and you are also trying to find a good way to sort of uh, put your uh, well vector in your uh, big space, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that just seemed like a way that I could. Uh, take the all the the background I have in reservoir computing and cellular automata and sort of find some uh, correlated or at least uh, nice uh, nice direction that is parallel to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you you talked about evolutionary algorithms mm -hmm. and, and and speciation and and so on. So in what you're doing, what are the entities which correspond to the species? Right. Yes, that's that's a very big topic, actually. Like, uh, how do you actually define what is the difference between yeah. a species? Right. There's there's like a whole list of different methods, but like if we classify it a little bit, you could uh, if you're familiar with the genotype uh, phenotype yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to the topology, there's also you can add on top of it like the behavior type as well. Yeah. Uh, but if you just talk about uh, genotype and phenotype, you can do a, just a trivial distance in the genotype yeah. as one way yeah. but uh in in my case i was most interested in using it on a like uh it's sort of a phenotype of like what 
features of uh, entropy values you have in the, yeah. the result of, of this whole system, um, which is more like a phenotypical uh, yeah. distance. Um, so, um, in yeah, thinking about genotype phenotype mm -hmm. distinction, and given that you're using cilia or automata, you could view the cilia or automata definition as being genotype and the set of hypervectors generated by it as being phenotype. I guess so, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so just sort of interested in, in the, the notion of whether you might actually be evolving the population of hypervectors. So in some sense, mm. if you're doing a, a computation where you're you've got representations being created on the fly and you're trying to search for some set of representations mm -hmm. which in some sense are consistent with each other, consistent with some long-term memory, whatever, then you could view the uh, you know, that, that calculation as being an evolutionary thing where what's evolving is the population of representations. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess, yeah. Oh, and I was just wondering whether, yeah, what relationship that would, would bear to the, the kind of thing you're doing. Um, well, I mean, I was I was thinking more of of uh, like evolving a, a method of good uh, of good expansion in a way, so that I can get great like uh, in terms of there's a whole this theory around like equistate property or 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 um, separation property or, or all these sort of features that your response is supposed to have to be like a good space for doing computation linearly at the end of it, right? Yeah. Uh, so in many ways, I'm trying to do the same thing, but in like a very different uh, space of cellular automata. In a, in a way, though, I'm, I'm trying it in a very um, open-ended way yeah. is what I'm trying to do by using, um, like, it's it's um, it's a very common topic when you talk about uh, speciesization and evolutionary algorithm to talk about open-endedness because that's like a feature that we don't typically have in these uh, AI systems that you have yeah. in biological evolution because there's like continuous novelty that uh, sort of arises and emerges from the system rather, from, rather than from um, your like special... Uh, enforced method like the uh, diversity metrics are um, but I don't have the billions of years to run this uh, naturally I suppose so I have to speed it up at some point. With, with, with the cellular automata that you've got mm -hmm. I mean, so obviously you can think of a specific cellular automata as being a piece of hardware that does a particular job. Yeah. Could you conceive of specifying so yeah, effectively having a program which specifies what your cellular automaton is and so where i'm heading with that is mm -hmm. yeah, would you have a hypervector which basically is the instructions for a general purpose cellular automaton machine and so the different values of this the hypervector mm -hmm. correspond to definitions of different cellular automata yeah that, that... evolve over that hypervector set of values uh i i can certainly conceive of that for yeah. sure yeah it's um uh, how that specifically would be would be very open, I think, because it's like depends on what you interpret the the hypervector to be, right? But uh, but I've thought of like other ways to set up similar things, like using cartogenetic genetic programming to find the Boolean gate instead, um, and then like different uh, high dimensional vectors could represent different functions in that and or something. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a little bit fuzzy to me. That's I'm very very new to the high dimensional computing space. Um, so I'm just like sticking to the the parts that I'm comfortable with of, of that space. Um, yeah, I think I saw another question. I think you were yeah yeah. So uh, I've seen a lot of work from cellular automata in HDC and mm -hmm. um, for the evolutionary kind. Uh, so there's sort of like two granularities to the evolution. If we take something like a human, for example, so the human dies, all the cells die, right? Mm -hmm. But also the cells are, neurons in the brain are dying on their own, yep. for example, as time goes on. So there's these two levels of granularity for something that's an intelligent agent. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen too much work on something like that. Um, I can't tell you anything in the high dimensional computing space, but there's there's a couple of like people who try to do this two loops, right? There's uh, what's a good example of that? Uh, Hypernet, maybe if you're familiar with that, or Neat. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Augmented topologies is the yeah. Uh, I forget the full abbreviation, but it's it's like you're essentially evolving the topology that you use to solve your problem. 
So you have this, it's not the same, I know, because there's not like the whole uh, redundancy in the living dying system, but it's, uh, you have a, a couple of systems has these double loops, right? Where you have uh, two different evolutions going on at the same time. Um, the, re the reason I bring up this, because there, there's some other work, not really directly to uh, cellular autonomy, mm -hmm. that seems to imply that the hypervector is a good model for the cellular, like the cortical stack, basically. Yeah. And so you have this need of like taking multiple different hypervectors that exist on our own and integrating into uh, a central like human level intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. So oh, it, it seems like that's a good fit here, but I haven't seen too much on it, at least in HCC. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that in in the general field of cellular autonomy, they have these two solutions. Uh, right. Well, I mean, like a hypernet is, is in neural networks, but there's something called hyperCA, which has done that, which is uh, by my supervisor. I, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I said, yeah. uh, I suggest we move on. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you, Tom. But it doesn't work. Yeah, it's fine. I, I, I have your screen on that. Yes. Um, oh, man, the resolution here. Um, uh, decrease one size, yes, right. Um, so you can see my whole screen, right? Yes, yes. awesome, awesome. Um, so yeah, first of all, um, last talk was really great. I've done a lot of um work on the same kind of um kind of stuff. Uh, with, uh and what, what one I would I'm particularly interested in is like you you have this like rule ninety or yeah you have particular rules with specific properties and you have uh, papers exploring uh, how you can use this for random number generation uh, for hashing um, so so there are actually some like useful work based on this uh, and that's because it's it it has it is very simple and it's, it can be distributed really easily um, so I I made like a, a slightly more general function here, synthesize, it can take any like targets of a um, of a map of a Boolean function we want to produce. Uh, so in, in the case of like um, the, the, the rule 90, it would be something like, uh, like bin uh, 90 and then um, so something like um, for, for each, uh, Binary thing in that you say uh, something like this, right? And if you if you give this as, as a target here, then you synthesize the the um, XOR based uh, function that that was shown in, in the previous talk, um, and then of course yeah that, that's an exact function, but that's Mostly, you don't want one exact function. You actually want like a, a network with multiple readouts, um, and then you can indeed like um, at, you you have multiple equivalent networks. You you need a certain power. You can't just make such a network with uh, XOR or just with for what you need. It's like you need some combination, for example, majority and not, or XOR and not, or select and equal. Um, this is also known as like if then else with like equal conditions. Uh, and, and then these layers simply look like uh, set selection and um, an equality, like not XOR, is, it's just equality. Um, anyways, moving on. Um, so what, what I've been working on uh, is the, the idea that you can have, um, you, you can scale your bundle operation and I'm working with Boolean hypervectors here, so it's majority, but you can scale that uh, beyond your vector size uh, because that's like pretty large limitation. Uh, if you look at a lot of their literature, they only scale their target domains up to the natural capacity uh, of, um, of their uh, hypervector dimension or the other way around. They have like a programmatic uh, dimension and they they just pick that dimension in function of what problem they're trying to to solve. Um, but for for some um, application, or for some reasons, it's really interesting if you have like a a one one size fits fits all, 
Uh, and you can just solve this by having multiple hypervectors. Uh, and so one naive way you could do this is you could take, uh, you, you could encode this as a list of, of hypervectors. And a list of hypervectors, like the simplest thing you can do is you can just chunk the data you have, like here hypervectors is your data. And you say like how many uh, items you want to uh, get it into. And then for each one of those, you you just take the, the bundle operation uh, for, for that chunk. And if you do this, you can store like, uh, like for example, a thousand, um, a, a thousand vectors and have pretty okay recall. Um, so th this is doing it for uh, all kinds of different sizes. But for example, for five blankets, let's pass here, for example, for five blankets, you're storing 200 hypervectors, uh, 200 hypervectors and one hypervector with bundle. Um, and then uh, you can see that this, this is like eight standard deviation, like uh, on average it's five standard deviations away from the noise floor. Um, while this is like a random noise, yeah, in, in this case, it's like one standard deviation away from the noise floor. So this is like your trivial accuracy from, from the bundle. And the more, if you go to like a blanket size of like a year 14, your chunk size is 72. And you can retrieve this with like over eight um, standard deviations of, of accuracy, which is, uh, uh, of course, um, because you're just having a bunch of bundles of um, of size seven, 72. And we are working here with 8,192 dimensional hypervectors. So uh, that, that works out. So this is not the best you can do because this is just like, th this is not redundant. So it's kind of in the spirit like against the spirit of, of hyperdimensional computing. Um, if, but, but we can do better. And one uh, naive way to do this is to have uh, a policy um, that's in, instead of just um, ju just taking like the, the non-overlapping chunk. So like this one, if you, if you have a bunch of vectors, like, what the blankets look like is you have a blanket and then right next to it, you have another blanket covering a bunch of elements and like this, right? But um, here, what you do is you actually uh, optimally uh, overlap them. Uh, so it goes like, yeah, like this, but e e even better. Like, like this, right? So you, you you can imagine trying to cover space with different blankets, and each of these is like a, a, a bundle. So you take uh, if if um, the the bottom thing if these are your elements, then what you're doing is you're taking uh, these elements into this majority vector, and uh, and and this element is also taken in this majority vector, right? Uh, and so you can cover this with multiple ones and get some redundancy. Um, and well, that gives you very similar results, but you're doing like twice as storage. You can compare it like to like rate zero and, and rate one, right? Uh, so if you look at, um, for example, here, you're um, doing, um, you're dividing, so to say in like, uh, you could cover this with four vectors, but you're covering it with 12 vectors. Um, <coughs> And you you get basically get the same accuracy as you had before. What is fun about this though is that it's more robust. So now we were taking uh, bundles of random hypervectors, but we can take bundles of um, like the, the uh, vectors with a certain correlation. Um, the correlation here is that uh, it's a path. So instead of doing a uh, the, generating them orthogonally. You start with the seeds, and then you update that seeds like by flipping a certain fl fraction. So, like for example, uh, you're flipping like uh, three and ten, right? Um, and and so your um, this is gonna this is equivalent, but runs a lot slower. Uh, so what so what you're doing is you're introducing some kind of um, mm, 
yeah, so, some kind of non-orthogonality. Uh, because if, if you do this like 10 times, then uh, the, the, you get like uh, one minus this to the uh, tenth, which is like, means that almost all bits are flipped. Um, and yeah, that's, so it, it's, it, it, they are not all related, but they are related in the string wise fashion, right? Um, and you can see that you still get like an accuracy of one, uh, but uh, if you do this with a no overlap, like you get you get a lower uh, you get a lower accuracy. Th this is kind of annoying though because you have to think about even more numbers. We already have to think about dimension and uh, about like the capacity of our majority. And so there there are a bunch of tricks to to get rid of this. Um, one of the first tricks uh, is ha actually having a, a measure on um, how much you can store in a vector of a certain size. So this is this is a formula you've probably seen in a few, in a few papers. Uh, I didn't know about it, but um, talking to people at the conference here, uh, it's uh, apparently a well-known thing. Uh, this is the capacity of um, a, like the, the expected bit error rates of a vector and that vector in a bundle with like n other vectors, right? Um, and, and so we make an index of this and then we do a reverse look basically. Uh, like if we want a given bit error rate, for example, we want to, uh, or, or having distance, um, if we want a given distance of say 3%, then we now know how many uh, elements we can bundle in our majority to get this. Um, and then taking one more utility, we can actually uh, think in standard deviations instead of thinking in a fraction. And now what we are left with is um, having a system where we can uh, just say what standard deviation we want uh, and how sure we want to be of that standard deviations. Yes, some higher order probabilities here, uh, but it's not all too scary. And so if we take the policy we started with and uh, we say we want to recover it with five standard deviations accuracy, and we want to be two standard deviations sure about our five standard deviations accuracy. Uh, and I didn't mess anything up. Oh, yes, I did, but it doesn't matter too much. Uh, then you can see that uh, for a thousand elements, um, like it automatically decides that it should use 10 hypervectors to retrieve it with five standard deviations of accuracy. So I think that's a large improve in a uh, large improvement in like the um, how how much thinking work you have to do and how much numbers you have to fill in any everywhere uh, to get to your results. Uh, there are of course other policies to do this. This is non-overlapping. You of course have the um, the the perfect overlap I showed earlier. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing like a really expensive computation here. And, and you can see like uh, this this score is a lot lower because well our recovery here is only um, is only uh, three standard deviations and we have two standard deviations redundancy. So we increase this so like this. And there are also some bugs in the code still. I wrote this last night. So um, yeah, okay. There's not quite what you expect, but it's all better. Um, and then um, what you can also do, and I actually talked with someone about this. I, th I, think, I think we talked about this yesterday where you can do like uh, a majority, um, different majorities like redundantly, but with the different permutations. I didn't do the permutations, but I did like a, a bind and then unbind it again. Um, and uh, surprisingly actually, so this is the base, right? Um, this is the base, you're exploring that with your hypervector um, and you can choose how many bases you want. Uh, here, there are like two different hypervectors you're doing this with. And surprisingly, this works equally well as subdividing, um, as subdividing into smaller uh, bundles. So creating like two bundles um, that are 
redundant with uh, exploring everything in them and like combining the distances from that is equivalent to taking two smaller bundles and uh, and checking each of those. Uh, so I, I think that's a relatively interesting result. Let's see if the, I'm actually speaking the truth. Uh, it's not quite as good, but I presume that's, oh, um, yeah, I'm not speaking. Probably introduced the bug somewhere. Um, oh no, uh, yeah, so th this is actually a great point um, where I wanted to get to, yes. So notice that here um, I, I'm introducing another bias, which is I'm actually taking the majority of composites instead of random vectors. And uh, this messes with some methods really, really poorly. So depending on like your blanket strategy, like how you're covering things, um, they are robust to different uh, forms of correlation. So if you change the form of correlation to being the batwise one I talked earlier, this is also a pretty bad correlation, but we will see how it does here. You can see it's uh, now up to 99.9% .9 accurate. Uh, so this is just equal, uh, an equal amount of uh, bias, but in, in, in a different way. Uh, and then of course the bad one um, should, uh, or sorry, the orthogonal one, right, should give us the theoretical uh, optimum of, of this method um, with the grasp, of course, that this is all probabilistic. Um, all right, that's all I have for you. Okay. Thanks. Any any quick questions? Go on. Or we say, say them for... <laughs> We do so. Thank you. All right. No, oh, uh, can you um, can you um, uh, disable this um, uh, presentation mode? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, my name is uh, Delanta. So I'm uh, starting my PhD in uh, the Latro uh, University. So I'm uh, mainly focusing on uh, sparse representation models uh, in VSA. So, so the, if I talk about the motivation to uh, it's like why sparse representations, it mainly it's because of the efficiency that we talk about. This is like, uh, uh, if you can see the hypervector, so in the sparse representation, it's only like a small fraction of uh, elements uh, you, uh, at a given time. So this can uh, basically yeah. so so this can uh, basically reduce the computational load and memory requirements and uh, most importantly uh, it is uh, energy efficient in uh, near morphic computing. So and there are also other uh, uh, properties of sparse representation like this capacity and scalability and also this. Uh, uh, memory consolidation, uh, which is like uh, one of the uh, natural processes in drain, uh, where only like the most relevant uh, features of memory are stored. It's like you can argue it's like a feature selection. So we only focus on like most important ones. So uh, based on those, so uh, I'm currently uh, experimenting on uh, uh, some uh, how to apply sparse representation models in. Uh, existing uh, VSA algorithm. So we are looking into like a uh, time series classification using uh, VSA core state networks. So this uh, uh, ESN implementation is based on work by Vinny and Dennis. Uh, they, so, uh, I, uh, so I did some modification to the learning part. So we are, originally they, are, they have been using uh, risk decision, which actually uh, become uh, problematic to when uh, we try to uh, preserve the sparsity. Uh, so then also uh, for the sparse representation, uh, we are currently using uh, sparse block codes uh, uh, proposed by uh, LIHO. So currently the results are not that satisfactory, so you won't see them uh, in the slides. But uh, so uh, we did this uh, simple experiment. Uh, so I am mean, trying to figure out uh, uh, what is going wrong. So uh, which is uh, this experiment is uh, basically based on uh, a dollar of Mexico. So uh, we uh, 
should that uh, there's like compatibility between the sparse block codes and the FHRR. So in the sparse block codes, it means like, uh, so the hypervector is divided into like blocks. So each block has only one active element. So these are like binary uh, hypervectors. So uh, this uh, one, uh, so this a single block uh, represent uh, uh, one element in uh, Fetchara. Uh, Fetchara. So it, it's like uh, if you consider a size 10 block, it's like we are dividing 2 phi into uh, 10. So it's like quantization level. So uh, in that uh, concept, so we uh, compared uh, uh, sparse block codes and FHRA uh, uh, with uh, this uh, simple experiment. So uh, as you can see uh, here, we are using a block size of 10. So we are comparing uh, sparse block codes and FHRA. So uh, if we consider like a 2,500 dimension uh, hypervector in S plus uh, block codes, uh, we need to compare it with uh, 250 dimension of uh, FHR for the compatibility. So uh, even then, so uh, you can see the FHR is performing well. Uh, about, so we are figuring out uh, what is going wrong, but uh, uh, still uh, looking uh, for solutions. Uh, However, the uh, uh, main questions that we have is like uh, uh, how to use past representations and uh, it's like where and how to use It's like, uh, uh, do we need to use them all uh, throughout the algorithm? So like, uh, uh, do we need to preserve the sparsity throughout the algorithm? So it's like, then we need to understand the limitations compared to the dense implement, uh, dense, uh, the presentations and also uh, like we, we need to uh, we are looking for ways to like quantize the uh, gains in terms of uh, performance or efficiency likewise and also we are looking into uh, the sparse representations that are in other domains except for VSA it's like uh, compressed sense in uh, expand and sparsify and HDF. Uh, yeah, uh, that's all I have for the moment. Thank you. So if we have again quick questions, maybe time now. No, then no. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. No. I stepped out for a second. Uh, sparse block code is that where you it's essentially FHR but discretized phase? Exactly. Okay. Uh, and so you essentially discretize phase into 10 bins. Yeah, that, that's uh, what I uh, Yeah, that, that uh, I mean, we can question whether it is actually sparse. So that's something that we are also looking into. So, yeah. yeah it occurs to me it's it's like, yeah, the, this uh, spiking phasers are sparse in time. Exactly. If I have a thousand lines on which I can see those, I prefer it if you are using ten of those sparse rather than you or most of the time rather than using all thousand of them most of the time.
All right. Thank you. So next. Yeah. All, all, all good. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sachin Kahavala. I'll be presenting on work in progress algorithm for Hyperbase. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so it, it's been a uh, uh, collaborative work with our center, Latrobe University, and uh, mainly New Guinea. Uh, yeah, so some of, uh, you may have come across the name called Hyperseed, uh, something we published last year on TNNLS. Uh, so basically, what we are trying to do is we are trying to approximate the manifold using fractional power encoder surfaces. Uh, so with hyperseed, uh, mainly we tried the one in left where we uh, we tried to approximate the entire manifold using a single fractional power encode surface, but uh, uh, it worked uh, relatively well. But for complex data sets, uh, it, it had some issues. So with our next version, uh, the hyperbase, we are trying to approximate the manifold using a set of different fractional power encoded surfaces. Uh, similar to you can see uh, as uh, uh, shown in the right diagram. So uh, fractional power encoded surfaces, you may uh, have come across the way we uh, create a 2D FE surface. So this is just the way of creating the surface. And basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to map data from data space into the fractional power encoded surfaces, but in Hyperbase is not just a single FP patch, but multiple of them. So I will not go into describing the algorithm. So I will uh, show some results that we have. So Swiss roll, it's something, uh, uh, one of the benchmark data sets that, that's been used to uh, test on manifold learning algorithms. So you can see it has this uh, weird uh, like Swiss roll kind of uh, shape and yeah on the left we have the general data and on right what we have is each color the data from each color will be uh, is uh, represented on a single fractional power encoder surface so here we have around like 20 different uh, fractional power encoder surfaces describing the entire data set so uh, that's the uh, that's th this is the result on the Swiss roll. So I'll go for a bit of a complex data set. So uh, this one, we, we had definitely trouble with hyperseed on uh, uh, MNIST like uh, somewhat complex data set. So here uh, I'm uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm only, uh, I have selected only class seven. And this uh, plot is basically the uh, how each data represent on this. Uh, this is a basically this is a single fractional power in, uh, encoded configuration, and these uh, dots show how where they placed on this surface. So out of uh, there were total four hundred thirty three data samples, and to describe all the four thirty three samples, there were twenty five different FP configurations that were constructed using the hyperbase algorithm. And this is basically one of them. And you can see in the top, we have just uh, general uh, like number sevens. And in the right, you can see uh, it, the sevens with this ho ho horizontal cross on the middle. So it, it kind of cap captures these uh, similarities uh, with the, uh, the, with the uh, basically with some simple methods like, like we, we just uh, use binding and binding a sample into a fractional power encoded surface so that it can it will uh, create a like a attractor field on that FE. So this is some result on MNIST. And on last some key points. So uh, encoding is significantly important and uh, it has to be also in the current version it has to be if it's a and and uh, Again, one another point is it has to preserve the similarity in face angles as well. So that's something important. Uh, and so these are some comments. So th <clears throat> there's some parameterizations, for example, bandwidth of each fractional power encoding. That's something we have to uh, uh, 
inform the algorithm in advance and there is some threshold of uh, uh, to decide whether a data sample belongs to a certain FE. So that's something, again, we have to uh, decide on advance and they, they, they have significant uh, impact on the algorithm performance. So they have to be uh, decided optimally. And these are two, two different parts that we are uh, we are working uh, we are working in future. So how can we organize these uh, different patches in a way it makes sense uh, to <coughs> if we if we, if we ha have a look at it all at once how 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 can we have a meaningful projection out of them and uh, a generative paths that's something like let's say. Uh, how uh, how a node in somewhere around here will look like if we were to go backwards and see uh, 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 the image where there is no actual data on, uh, in here. So, but if you have a, uh, we are working on some generative work where we can go back and project something uh, to see how the actual data looks like. Yeah, so that comes to an end of the presentation. If you have any questions. Yeah, we have time for Yeah, um, so I was wondering, uh, are there any like classical machine learning kind of like uh, discovery algorithms which are very close to the sort of different characters in the field of day the BSA version? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, uh, we started this with our initial uh, version, Hyperseed came. Uh, like trying to mimic the behavior of uh, some self-organizing maps, yeah. but now it's somewhat like deviated from that. Uh, where which uh, compared to some here we use like very few samples. For example, for that uh, for four hundred thirty-three uh, all the data points, we only use like fifty samples to and uh, come up with those patches. So very. Uh, Portion of the a small portion of the data is used to construct the these different services. Yeah, uh, so far th there are some work that has been done on piecewise linear approximation on manifold, but this is something uh, completely different. Uh, but the pipeline is somewhat similar, but the algorithm wise, this is different. Okay. Yeah, then I guess just an obvious question. Uh, when you showed the figure with the set, what happens when you run it on a full data set? Does it, does it yeah, it yeah, uh, yeah. The... yeah. So then uh, it will be like some patches describing some classes, entire classes, and then uh, there will be, for example, two and seven will be having will be falling into same patch, but in two ends, likewise. So that, that's that's the behavior uh, when you run on the full data sets. And and maybe I mean so here you have a kind of a clear indication of the similarity. So you uh, so maybe for example, if you take two uh, numbers. So yeah, yeah, I mean uh, it will be it can uh, fit into a uh, FP configuration for seven, but it will have a lower similarity mm -hmm. in, within, within this punch than in dedicated punch for number two. So yeah, it's kind it's of easy. sensitive to specific. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we were, were you able to use this um as a as a classification yeah, yeah. algorithm? Yeah. So far we uh, we have tested for MNIST the accuracy is around like we have achieved like 88. Uh it's not the uh, so th there has been significant changes uh since we tested the original this 88 accuracy on the encoding pipeline. Uh, so uh, because we need this uh, HRR uh, encoding, we have been using uh, mainly FFT, but uh, there seems to be an issue with the FFT where it, it doesn't preserve the original similarities in the base angles. So now we are using a discrete cosine transform, then FFT uh, on, on the DCT, uh, DCT samples. So, with that one, we have to try it now. Uh, in the in the current state, we are trying to understand the behavior uh, with this uh, current encodings that we have come come first. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. And, so and how does it how does it compare to other algorithms for for? Uh, yeah, for MNIST, since this is fully unsupervised, uh, uh, I think still th th there are like nine or over ninety accuracy unsupervised algorithms, but this has significant advantages where it uses very few, uh, very uh, limited amount of data, uh, and it kind of can work in an online manner. So uh, there will be a, definitely a trade off between the uh, accuracy and the performance, I guess. Okay. Uh, thank you once again. Yeah.